Okay, well, um, let's look in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 8. Uh, I've been looking here for a few weeks. And unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, whichever the case may be, uh, uh, I can't get everything said that I want to say in, uh, in a short period of time, so I'm breaking it up over several weeks. Otherwise, I'd be standing here talking for a long time, but we don't want to do that. I don't want to do that either. Um, plus, if I break it up over a few weeks, it gives me time to think about it even more. And, um, anyway, uh, this is a very familiar passage in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8. And by the way, Paul is authoritative. We can take, uh, take what he says to the bank, uh, so to speak. We can trust and rely on uh, what Paul says. I run into people sometimes who um, don't like the Apostle Paul, I don't know how you can afford to just pick somebody who wrote three quarters of the New Testament and say you don't like them, but I have had people tell me that, more than one, and the reason always is because what he has to say when they get into it and read it, uh, it contradicts what they think it should be, it contradicts their church ideas, their religious ideas. So rather than let go of their religious ideas, their prejudices and their predisposed opinions, they would rather X out three quarters of the New Testament. And one man even told me, he says, well, I don't, even, I don't ever read the Apostle Paul. I don't ever read what he wrote because it confuses me. Well, the reason it confuses him is because it contradicts what he thinks and you know, his religious uh, upbringing or his presuppositions. But the truth of the matter is we can have all kinds of religious ideas in our head that may or may not be right. And the only way to determine if they're uh, correct or if they're uh, useful is to be willing to adjust our thinking in terms of what we read when we read in the New Testament. Uh, like I heard uh, one man say, if what I'm saying uh, rubs the cat's fur the wrong way, then I say turn the cat around. <laughs> you know, some people say it rubs, rubs me the wrong way. Uh, if it rubs you the wrong way, uh, in other words, if it rubs the cat's fur the wrong way, turn the cat around. Uh, that's better than trying to turn the Bible around. And so this, these verses in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 are, are like that. Uh, for some reason, uh, people object to what Paul has to say here. I think it's good news, and I think, uh, oh, by the way, I started to say Paul is authoritative. If you take his word for it, um, he was appointed and chosen by Jesus specifically to bring this message to people like us. People like us meaning Gentiles. We don't usually think of it in that term because that's an Old Testament kind of mindset. It's an Old Testament um, uh, way of seeing things. In the Old Testament, there was a chosen people of God. You notice how I put that in the past tense. There was a chosen ethnic people of God, the Jews and the nation of Israel. It's a political group. It's an ethnic group. It's a religious orientation. It was specific and it was uh, exclusive. And if you wanted to be part of the people of God, you had to uh, convert to Judaism. You had to be a Jew. You had to either be born into it or convert into it. Everybody else was called Gentiles. They were the outsiders. But Jesus appeared to Paul, if we can take his testimony, and told him, Paul, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. That is to say, people who were not part of the Old Covenant, people who would have been excluded. And he gave, Jesus gave Paul a message. And so what we're reading here is information that he um, has given, has written in these letters to people just like us. Uh, in Ephesians, he's writing to a church in Ephesus. Uh, these are not Jews, these are, uh, uh, well, they're Christians now but they're Gentiles. In fact, in this very chapter, um, in fact, I, I was going to read from verse 8 since I'm talking about this. Look uh, at verse 11. Usually I stop with verse 10, but look at what he says in verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, which are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Notice how he emphasizes that. It's all a carnal distinction, a, a, an outward fleshly distinction. So in the past, you were considered to be Gentiles by those who were... Uh, circumcision, of course, is the symbolic uh, ritual act that uh, is the initiation into Judaism. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were sometimes afar off are made near by the blood of Christ. By the way, did you notice... Uh, in this verse, what he says makes us near to God. It says, see, when he says, you are made nigh, the word nigh, we don't use that in modern English. Nigh means near. That's an old English word for near. It says, you are made near to God by the blood of Christ. Sometimes people say, 
I hear people say this all the time. I'm trying to get closer to God. Well, there's only one way you can get close to God, and it's by the blood of Christ. And by the way, the blood of Christ refers to his death on the cross. Isn't that right? We sang about the blood this morning. The only time Jesus ever shed any blood was when he died for our sins on the cross. That's what makes us near to God. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, there, there are ways you can become more aware and more uh, uh, focused in your own mind on God. But as far as being near to God, it's the blood of Jesus that makes us near to God. So uh, we were uh, Gentiles, and uh, Jesus' blood brought us near to God. Oh, what I started to say was Paul is authoritative. We can trust what he has to say. Now back to verse 8. This is what I wanted to say. That's all extra, no charge for that. Verse 8 says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now in these verses, Paul emphasizes the subject of grace. Grace is, uh, by one definition, God's unmerited favor. That means God's favor that he gives to us that is not earned, that has no connection to our performance, that's not based on our behavior. In fact, Paul in elsewhere emphasizes this fact that if it were based on our performance, then it wouldn't be grace, it would be a reward. Uh, in Romans, he says, I'm quoting from the message now, if you're a hard worker, you deserve your pay, but we don't call it a gift, it's wages. Uh, but here he's talking about grace. Grace is God's free gift. Uh, you notice the word gift is used here. It's God's unmerited favor, it's a gift, it's also, another definition of grace is what God does all by himself, just because he's God. Now, our part in this, you know, when I start emphasizing that, sometimes people get nervous and, uh, well, what does that leave for me to do? Well, what it leaves for us to do, our part is mentioned in verse 8, and it's very small. Paul devotes one word to what our part in this Christian life and this relationship with God is. Exactly one word, and that word is faith. Faith is uh, our positive response to God's grace. Uh, we either accept it and embrace it, which, of course, we here on Sunday morning, uh, we could safely say that we are in that category. Probably wouldn't be here if we weren't. Uh, some people uh, ignore it. Some people reject it. Some people are unaware of it. But that doesn't change God's grace. God's grace has been extended to the whole world. On the cross, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. But our part is faith. Uh, Anton, could you give me the message translation of verse 8 and 9? I think it's really enlightening. He says, um, saving is all his idea and it's all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. And then verse 9 says this, we don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. Now, in talking to some Christians, I think that's how they look at it. They, they, they want to, you know, emphasize all their um, strenuous moral striving and their hard work, and I've given up this, and I've given up that, and I don't go here, and I don't go there, and I don't do this, and I don't do that, as though that's what brings us near to God. We've already seen it's the blood of Christ that brings us near to God. But our part is to trust, or to rely, or to have faith. But the rest of this, in these verses, is all talking about God's grace. It's talking about God's work, talking about his gift, talking about what he does. He sums it up in verse 10 by saying, uh, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He means by that we as Christians. We are his workmanship. In other words, he made us. It's him at work. Now, uh, back in verse 8. Notice the wording. For by grace you are saved through faith. Faith is our part, but grace is his part. But the thing that is done by grace through faith is saved. Now this word saved or salvation, most people think of it in terms of conversion when I became a Christian, in a very narrow sense. But it applies to much more than that. It does mean that, but it means more than that. It also means your whole Christian life, your whole experience, uh, your whole growth as a Christian. That all comes under this category. You know, you can see here that uh, Paul had more in mind than uh, just conversion and, uh, and dying and going to heaven, but he's talking about our Christian life. He talks about our... Uh, uh, we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. But it's not those good works that make us acceptable to God. It's his grace that saves us. So in the one, on the one extreme or the one category of salvation, meaning just that experience that, if you want to say it this way, qualifies us to go to heaven when we die, 
Think about, as an example, the thief on the cross. I've mentioned this before. The, uh, these two malefactors, as the King James Bible says, thieves or criminals were crucified with Jesus. One on the left and one on the right. Luke's gospel tells, uh, tells us this story. And one of them began to mock Jesus, and uh, just like the Pharisees were doing. But the other one turned and rebuked his uh, fellow thief, criminal, and he said, uh, Don't you fear God, for we are in the same condemnation. But this man, meaning Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to this man, a thief, a criminal, a malefactor, he said to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. Didn't he say that? Um, a few weeks ago I was talking about this and Don Gay was here and she told me after church that she's had friends of hers say, I wish Jesus hadn't said that. <laughs> Speaking of having religious uh, uh, prejudices, the, the re why would somebody say, want to, want to correct Jesus? Say, I wish he hadn't said that to that thief on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. Well, you know why? Because that thief on the cross who did nothing more than believe in Jesus, he called him Lord. That expresses his faith in him. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That was his belief. That was his faith. He was trusting in Jesus, trusting that he was who he said he was, you see, putting his faith in Jesus. And that is the only thing that is necessary on our part. You see, some people, though, want to say lots of other things are necessary. But you know, this thief on the cross, he didn't do anything else. He didn't have any good works. He didn't have anything to uh, boast about. He didn't have any, he never went to church. He never took communion. He never was baptized. He never read the Bible. He never prayed. He never did any good deeds. He never helped a lady across the street. He never uh, gave to the poor. He didn't do anything that would make him uh, deserving of being in paradise. He didn't do anything. Now, all those things are good. It's good to go to church because we can hear about Jesus. Communion is good. Water baptism is good. Uh, giving to the poor is good. Giving to church is good. Everything, it's all good. It's all part of those good works that he has, pre, or, uh, as he has ordained beforehand that we should walk in them. But those things don't earn anything. They don't earn heaven for us. The reason Jesus said to this man, today you will be with me in paradise is because he did the one thing that's necessary to believe. He believed in Jesus. That's all that God's looking for, for us to believe, to put our faith in him, to rely on him. So, having done that, we're qualified to go to heaven, not based on anything that we do, not based on any of our good works. Like one lady said, I, went to, uh, I got calls from a family one time, and, uh, and the reason I'm telling you this is I'm pretty sure they don't go to this church. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're not watching this video, and they won't know that I tell this story. But uh, I got called to come pray with this lady who was an elderly woman who was dying. So the, the doctors had told them, and she wanted prayer, and I was happy to pray with her. And she said to me, uh, as I was getting ready to pray for her, she said, I hope I've done enough good things so that I can make it in. That's what she said. And uh, I didn't stop to preach her sermon right then or to correct her, and I said, let me pray for you. But I, I pondered that. As far as I knew, she'd been in church all of her whole life, a churchgoer. Uh, but yet uh, she didn't seem to have any confidence and probably because she heard at church a lot of emphasis on all the good things you're supposed to do but you see what I'm emphasizing today is what Paul says here by grace you're saved through faith not of yourselves it's the gift of God not of works you don't work for it if you think of salvation in terms of dying and going to heaven you can think of it this way it's all his work it's all a gift a free gift and all we're supposed to do is trust in the one he sent to be the Savior, and that's Jesus. Now, that thief on the cross that Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, I take it that Jesus meant what he said, don't you? Now think for a moment. Consider this for a moment. That man died that day. Jesus also was dead by the end of the day. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But they took his body down from the cross, I'm talking about the thief, and they buried it. It didn't go anywhere but it was his spirit that was with Jesus in paradise. Isn't that right? His body stayed here. What was in paradise, what was instantly made ready for heaven, instantly uh, purified and perfected was his spirit at the moment that he believed in Jesus. Now we here as Christians, we're not a thief dying on the cross. We're not going to die today. We've got our lives. We go on living. Our spirit is ready to go to heaven, but see, we have more life to live in this body, on this earth, in this flesh. But this word salvation encompasses that too. 
And it's also by grace, through faith, the same principle, the same rule, if you want to call it that, governs that as well. Now, what most Christians make a mistake by doing is they think, all right, I'm saved, I'm ready to go to heaven by faith, but now everything else is up to me. No, it's up to him. We are his workmanship, he says. Now, to demonstrate that, look in uh, Philippians chapter 1 just for a second. Notice what he says uh, writing to the Philippians. This is in chapter 1. Um, oh, I might as well just read down to it. It's verse 6, but I'm going to start with verse 1. Just so you see the context, make sure you, I'm not pulling a fast one on you. Uh, verse 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always and in every prayer of mine, making a uh, request with joy that, uh, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Listen to this now in verse 6. Being confident of this very thing. Now, he says he's confident about this. This is, in other words, he has assurance about this. That's what confidence means. He's assured, he's certain about this very thing he's about to say here. Being confident of this very thing. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now in my Bible, which is a King James Bible, it's a reference Bible. And in the middle margin, there are little numbers that give you alternate ways that words could be translated. And on this word perform, in my Bible, there's a little number and it says complete. So we could read it that way. He which hath begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, he said, somebody began a good work in you. That's Jesus. We could call that what most people would call saved or salvation. That's the initial, uh, what we might call that conversion. But you notice he says, he began and he will complete it. It's not he began and you complete it. It's that he began and he will complete it. The Amplified even makes it more plain. Ampl Anton, Ampliton. <laughs> Anton, could you give me the Amplified just for a second? And get ready for lots of words. Amplified always has more words. I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, and then brackets, right up until the time of his return. Listen, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. Now that's good thought, isn't it? That's Christian growth. That means that we are transformed and that we grow as Christians. But notice who works. Just speaking grammatically, who's doing the work here, you or him? Well, he says specifically and directly that he started the work and he performs it. He perfects it. He brings it to full completion. Did you notice that? Yeah. Please do think about that. I think if you took a poll, if you stopped most Christians, if you could interrupt church today, go into all the churches and suddenly interrupt church, say, wait a minute, I want to take a survey. Who's going, how are you going to be complete as a Christian? How are you going to, com how are you going to grow as a Christian? Well, what most people would tell you is, well, I've got to do, I've got to change. I know I've got to do better. And, you know, they get very self-conscious. I need to change. I need to fix this. I, I should quit doing that. I should start doing this. Look, it says, he that began will complete it. Didn't he say that? See, it all comes under this category of by grace through faith. It's his work. Now, we do have a part to play. We cooperate. And our part is to trust and to rely and to believe in him. We sort of... Uh, put ourselves under his um, uh, hand, you might say. We don't fight him. We don't resist him. We believe in him. We trust him. But it's him that's working. It's not you. Now, what most Christians think is that he's going to, it's like a test. He's going to grade me on my work. And, uh, and if I did good enough, he'll let me in. If I didn't, he'll kick me out. <laughs> no. He embraces you. He accepts you. He knew all about us before we ever came to him in the first place. He knows that work needs to be done, and he takes it on uh, to do the work. And it says he will, the same one that started it, will bring it to completion. Here's another passage where Paul says exactly the same thing in even more, if possible, even more pointed language. Look in Galatians chapter 3. Talk about some pointed, uh, kind of blunt language. Look at what Paul says to the Galatians in chapter 3. He's a little bit upset with them because he is afraid that they got in their minds that 
Maybe he saved them by grace, but now it's up to them to work, 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 and make it better. He says uh, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, and now, Anton, I'm back in King James. Look at what he says. Oh, foolish Galatians. By the way, I've got a lot of different Bibles in the office back here, and uh, I've, got one, I've got one translation where it says, you stupid Galatians. <laughs> Talk about blunt. That's, that's basically what he's saying. You silly you know, Galatians, that's what he's saying. Oh, foolish Galatians. Now, what would prompt him to use this sort of, almost, we would say, rude? You know, if I spoke to uh, somebody that way, it would, I would feel like I was being rude. He is being very blunt. He's trying to get their attention. He says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? In other words, who cast a spell on you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? In other words, having begun by a work of God spiritually, are you going to make it better or perfect it or bring it to completion by your own work in the flesh? That's what that means. Uh, look at the, uh, Anton, go back to verse 1 and, and let's look at the message translation. I like what the message says. Sorry, I'm dropping everything. Batteries and wrappers. And <laughs> um, listen to this in the message. You crazy Galatians, did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened, for it's obvious that you no longer have the crucified Jesus in clear focus. It sounds to me like he, he is trying to say you should have the crucified Jesus in clear focus at all times. Why, by the way, would he want us to have a crucified Jesus in clear focus? Because the crucified Jesus was being crucified to pay for your sins, to use strict Bible language. He was, uh, as 1 Peter 2.24 says, he carried our sins in his own body on the tree. To say it in more uh, easy to understand language, he was eliminating everything that ever disqualified you from standing in the presence of God. Eliminating all your faults. Eliminating all your flaws. To use other Bible language, he was purifying you by his work on the cross. You didn't do it. He did it by himself. That's why Paul says you no longer have the crucified Jesus in clear focus, meaning that you should. His sacrifice on the cross was certainly set for you clearly enough, by Paul, that is. Okay, next verse. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Listen, this is very interesting. We just said that when we said, by grace you're saved through faith, most people think of salvation as conversion, how it starts. But he says here, how did it begin? Was it by working, off, uh, working your heads off to please God, or was it by responding to God's message to you? In other words, did you work your way to, to it, or did you just accept the message? Well, the obvious answer, this is a rhetorical question, by the way. A rhetorical question is a question that you're not meant to answer. It's just meant to make you think. The obvious answer is we just simply responded to God's message. We responded to it. Okay, next verse. Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. Now, that's pretty plain, isn't it? And I think that's a good thought. A lot of churches filled with crazy people today. <laughs> because that's what most, I think that's what most Christians think. <laughs> I think God, okay, God saved me. I believe that. But then he went away somewhere. He's gone. <laughs> now it's just me. No, he didn't go anywhere. So we are his workmanship. He that began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Only crazy people would think they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? That's pretty good, isn't it? I like this so well. Let's read a little more in the message. Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? It's not yet a total loss, but it certainly will be if you keep this up. He's really mad at them. Let's read the next verse. Answer this question. Does God, who lavishly provides you with his own presence, his Holy Spirit, working things in your lives you could never do for yourselves, does he do these things because of your strenuous moral striving or because you trust him to do them in you? The obvious answer is number two. It's because, or what he's saying here, it's simply that we trust him and let him work. He that began a good work brings it to completion. Our part is to have faith or to trust him to do it. Let's read one more verse. 
Don't these things happen among you just as they happened with Abraham? He believed God, and that act, listen to this, this is so good, that act of belief was turned into a life that was right with God. You see, God does it. We simply trust him. We rely on him. If we're ever confused, if we ever don't know what to say or what to do, all we've got to do, it's a very simple prayer. I'm tr God, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you about this. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I'm trusting you. He's the one that works. It's him at work. Now, uh, I'd like to look at another passage that what we've been emphasizing here, it's not our work. We don't bring it to completion. It's him. He starts it. He finishes it. Here's another passage. I was going to read this last week, but I ran out of time. It's in Romans chapter 1, and I'm going back to the King James. And this sheds a little more light on this question. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul's writing to Christians at Rome. Evidently, Paul has not ever been to Rome, from what he says here. Uh, he f has heard that there's Christians there, and he says, I've heard of you, heard of your reputation. And he says, uh, I would like to come and visit you, and I'm hoping to do so. And here is uh, verse 15. Let's start there. Verse 15. He says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. Now, wait a minute. These are Christians here. These are not sinners. This is not people who have never heard, the God, heard of Christ before. These are Christians, church people, already Christians. But he says, I want to come preach the gospel to you. We think many times that the gospel is just a message to evangelize or to get people to uh, believe in Jesus, people who've never heard. But you know what? Paul is preaching or talking here to Christians. He says, I want to come and preach to you the gospel. I want to come and tell it to you. Well, why is that, Paul? Verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Gospel, by the way, is a word that means good news. I am not ashamed of the good news of Christ. And the reason he says he's not ashamed is because he got a lot of criticism. He got a lot of attacks. He tells us elsewhere that the Greeks, who thought they were really smart because they had all these philosophers, like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and uh, they would sit around all day and debate uh, the, the fine points of philosophy, and they considered themselves really smart. When they heard what Paul had to say, they considered it to be foolishness. Paul says to the Greeks, it's foolishness. You mean to tell me that a man who died a criminal's death was executed on the cross, if I believe in him and what he did, then that's what makes me right with God apart from anything I do? And Paul's answer is yes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. On the other hand, there were Jews who were very religious people. They didn't like his message either. Their complaint was this. You mean to tell me that all I've got to do is believe in Jesus who died on the cross for me and that's what makes me right with God? And all of my strenuous moral striving, all of my work, all of my effort, all of my going to the Sabbath, going to the temple and offering animal sacrifices and and circumcision and, and uh, keeping the Sabbath day and, uh, and the food laws and not only that but hundreds of more laws and, uh, uh, and all these rules and regulations and, and maybe I'm not perfect but I did it better than everybody else. You mean <laughs> all I got to do is believe in Jesus? Yeah, that's what Paul said. So he's saying here, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, meaning everybody, I get a lot of criticism. That's what he's saying. I'm not ashamed of the good news. Notice that it is the gospel of Christ. It's not a message about you. It's a message about him. To say it another way, it's not a message about you and what you're supposed to do for God. It's about what God has done for you. That's what the gospel is. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Listen to this now. For it is the power of God unto salvation, meaning resulting in salvation, to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Now, he says here that the gospel, this message, is the power of God resulting in salvation. Now, for just a moment, don't think about the narrow definition of salvation, like the thief on the cross to whom Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. We're not going to die today, God willing, <laughs> hopefully. We're, we're going to go on living. But that principle of salvation continues to work. He that began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Remember what he said to the Galatians. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to get it started, how do you suppose by your own efforts you could, you could perfect it? Well, where the completion is, where the perfecting is, where the growth, where the progress is, is in this physical, human, everyday life. Where the transformation is, is in this physical, human, everyday life. And here's what we need to understand. It's him 
that's working. The same one that began it brings it to completion. Paul tells us a key thought here. He says the gospel is the power. This message of the gospel is the power of God resulting in salvation. Now think about salvation in a broader definition, meaning the bringing to con completion, the bringing to perfection, the transformation that takes place in our lives, Christian growth, working out all the details in our life that we live on this earth, this physical life. Paul here says it's not you and your effort and your strenuous moral striving. I got that from the message. I like that phrase. It's just him, but he says the gospel is the power. Did he say that? The gospel of Christ is the power of God resulting in salvation for everyone that believes it. And he's, got, he's just got through saying, I want to come to you Christians at Rome and preach the gospel to you. Why? Because he knew, Paul believed, that this message that he called the gospel contains within it and carries with it a power that has the power to work. It enables, it facilitates God's work in our lives as we believe it. Well, what is this message? What is this message of the gospel? What is this message that is the power of God unto salvation? Well, Paul has already alluded to it to the Galatians, what we read a moment ago, when he said, you no longer have the crucified Jesus in clear focus. I could just tell you, this is what the gospel is, but rather than me tell you, and you might go away saying, well, that's just his opinion, let me read to you a specific definition right from the mouth of the Apostle Paul. And it's found in Galatians chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I get one book on my tongue and it keeps wanting to come out again and again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he is concluding his letter to the Corinthians. He's wrapping it up. But just like all preachers, when he says in conclusion, he goes on for two or three more chapters. <laughs> I don't know why that happens. In conclusion, <laughs> and then a lot more. Um, but here he's concluding. He really is meaning to be in conclusion here, but there are, are more chapters. In conclusion, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen now. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Uh, declare means, in other words, we used to think declare it means just to tell it. Uh, really, a better translation would be, I want to remind you. That's what he's saying. I want to remind you of the gospel. So he's going to tell us here what this message exactly is. Moreover, brethren, I want to remind you of the gospel. By the way, what does he want to remind them of the gospel? Isn't it enough just to have heard it once and go on, go, go on? No, he says, you need to have it in clear focus all the time. He said to the Romans, I want to come and preach it to you. He said to the Corinthians, I want to remind you of it. Why? Because he says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God to transform and change our physical selves in this physical world. Now our spirit is ready to go to heaven right now, just like the thief on the cross. Nothing needs to change. It's perfect. It's perfected. Can't get any better. But it's this physical, carnal part of us where there's things that could stand some working out, and he's at work. But the gospel and our believing it is what facilitates it. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel, which I preached to you, which you received, wherein you stand. Another translation says, upon which you stand. In other words, we take our stand on and, and uh, place our faith in this message. Verse 2, by the which you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I think that's a little kind of a sarcastic aside. I don't think he really believes that they believe to no purpose. But he says, keep it in memory. Well, what is it then? Verse 3, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Stop right there for a moment. He didn't receive it from Peter, James, and John, who were apostles before him. He tells us back in Galatians, he said, the gospel that I preach, I didn't learn it from man. I got it straight from Jesus Christ himself. He gave me what to say. So when he says, I delivered to you first that which I received, this is the message of the gospel in a nutshell, in just a few words, that he got right from Jesus. In other words, Jesus gave this to him and said, this is the message I want you to tell them. Number one how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and then he goes on to talk about how he was seen of the apostles after his resurrection but that's the gospel right there 
It only took uh, two verses to tell it. The first part is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And the second part is he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. In other words, he's alive, just like we celebrate at Easter time. But evidently, from what he says here, we should be celebrating it all the time. He's alive and active and, 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 and capable of working. That's the point. But the first part is the most important part. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, that's just, you know, that's one of those things every, every Christian would say, yeah, I believe that. But we don't often stop and ponder it and think about what the implications of that are. I don't think you'd find a Christian anywhere who would deny that that's true. But the implications are where it gets a little more interesting. First implication is that we have sins. <laughs> oh no, a person would say, uh, I did have before as a Christian. Oh no, no, the truth is you've, ha you've made mistakes since you become a Christian. Everybody has. There's nobody living that's a Christian who hadn't done something wrong since they became a Christian. Some people have this idea, I don't know where they get it. Well, I do know. Uh, religious thinking, assumptions, maybe some incorrect church teaching. Some people think that when you become a Christian, your sins are forgiven up until that point, and then you get a clean slate. It's like one person said, your life is like a board, and when you commit sins, it's like driving nails in that board. But when you become a Christian, he pulls out the nails and gives you the board back again. No, he does not pull out the nails and give you the board back again. He takes that board full of nails and he throws it in the trash and gives you a new one, which is impervious to nails. It's his life, Christ that lives in you. Uh, it's a new spirit, spiritual condition. But you see, it's not that he forgave your sins before you were saved and after that it's a clean slate. The same sacrifice before you were a Christian that makes you saved, that forgives your sins, still is active as you are a Christian. Here's a good passage. I'm not even going to turn, but I'm going to have Anton put it on the screen for you. Look, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children. He's writing to Christians, right? That's why he says, my little children. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. Okay, everybody knows that. Churches preach that constantly. That's the message everybody loves to preach. Don't sin. Don't sin. But here's the question that is in everybody's mind. That here's that message in the back of their mind. What if I do? And if you don't answer it, if you don't address it, what most people think is, if I do, then I might as well give up. You know, as you know, I go to the prison on Sunday nights, and uh, men come to the church service, actually quite a lot, really. You'd be surprised sitting here on, on Sunday morning and just the, the, the few of us here, you'd be surprised on Sunday night, there's like 70 or 80 guys in that, in that room. It's an, amazing, uh, it's an amazing thing. But sometimes after I'm done and I'm walking from the chapel back to the gate to get out I'm walking across they call it the yard it's a big concrete slab where they can you know just hang out I'm walking across the yard as they call it and sometimes a man will come up to me more than once this has happened and he'll say well I didn't come to church tonight and okay you know whatever uh, but he said I want you to know uh, I used to be a Christian he said this has happened more than once I used to be a Christian but he says I backslid now did you know that that word backslid, we hear it a lot in church, but it's not in the New Testament. Did you know that word? If you look in the concordance, you'll ne you, you won't find that word. That's not a New Testament word or concept. He'll say, I used to be a Christian, but I backslid. Now, do you know what that means? That means I became a Christian, I went to church, but I made some mistakes and did some things wrong, and I gave up. That's what that means. But what I always tell them, this might shock you that I say this, I turn to a person like that every time I hear that, and I said, oh, I want you to know wherever you slid, he slid with you. <laughs> he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Now, you, what happens is Christians give up because this verse that I'm getting ready to read to you is not preached uh, openly. What they're told is don't sin, but they're not told what happens if you do, and they assume what happens if I do is I'm disqualified. That's not true. Notice what he says, what John says. My little children, I write these things to you that you sin not, very next breath. And if any man sin, well, what then? Is he kicked out? Is he rejected? Is he disqualified? No, he says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In other words, we have somebody that's on our side as people who have sinned, as Christians who have sinned. He's writing to Christians. He says, you have an advocate, not a judge, but an advocate. You know who the advocate is? If you ever have to go to court, you need to get a lawyer. Would you think that's good advice? Listen, don't go to court and represent yourself. <laughs> I heard one person say, the man who represents himself has a fool for an attorney. 
hire a professional lawyer. That's your advocate. He knows the law. Sometimes he even knows the judge. <laughs> That's even better. He, he's on your side. He pleads your case. He's fighting for you. He's talking about, and he says who it is. Our advocate, not our judge, not our critic, is our advocate. The one who is on our side is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now notice the next verse. This is really remarkable. And he, meaning Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation means a sacrifice. He says he is the sacrifice for our sins. Now who our, when he says our, ours, that's us Christians. And he makes it specific because he says, and not ours only, but also for the whole world. He says the same sacrifice that is for the world that somebody believes in to become a Christian is also good for the Christian who might happen to commit a sin. Now, here's what Paul said the gospel is. The message that is the power of God resulting in salvation. Not only the initial conversion experience, but your whole growth as a Christian life. The message that facilitates it is this. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. Not for you when you were a sinner and you became a Christian and then after that it's up to you. He said, for yours also. All the first part of the message is we have sins. You just, should just acknowledge that. I'm not, and John said, he's not saying that you should, but it's true that we do. We, I think if, if anybody's honest, you admit that sometimes you do things wrong. Have you ever said something wrong? Have you ever got upset and flew off the handle and said things you wish you hadn't said? Lots of people have done that. <laughs> it's easy to do things wrong, but you need to know, in case you do, there's somebody that's on your side and he's already made a sacrifice. That's the second part of this. Number one, this message of the gospel is that Jesus died, according, uh, died for our sins according to the scriptures. Number one is you have sins. Number two, uh, that he has died for them. In other words, the death has already taken place. The payment has already taken place. The restoration has already taken place. <laughs> the putting you back in right standing has already taken place. You don't get out of right standing with God because you commit a sin. You can't because the reconciliation has already taken place. The price that restores you has already been paid. As far as God's concerned, that reconciliation, restoration has already been made. Now what happens is, in your own mind, in your own conscience, you become uh, convicted and condi like the guy I told you about the prisons. I used to go to church, I used to be a Christian, but I backslid. Meaning I did something wrong and I felt bad about it, and so I just gave up. Uh, and some people might disagree with this, but uh, I think the way to deal with that, are you still in 1 John? Oh, yeah, go back to chapter 1 just for a second. Chapter 1, verse 9. I think that that's what this is for. It says, if we confess our sins, not to a priest, not to some person, but just to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, it's not that he's taking count of it and he uh, uh, is holding it against you. He's already forgiven you. He's already, as far as he's concerned, the price has already been paid. But it's right up here where you have a, con, uh, a, a sense of condemnation and conviction if we do something wrong. And it's right up here where the cleansing takes place. Now, this is very interesting. What, you know, I think most people misunderstand this completely. You know, what a lot of Christians think is, falsely, wrongly, I think is, if I commit a sin, then I'm not saved anymore. But if I confess it, now I'm saved again. But if I commit another sin, now I'm not saved. And if I confess it, then I'm saved again. That makes your salvation hinge on your memory <laughs> and your sensitivity to what you've done wrong. You might have done something wrong and not realized it. Hello? But from God's point of view, he's already cleansed all of it. And as far as he's concerned, you don't ever get out of fellowship with him. But it's in your own thinking where this cleansing needs to take place. Now, here's what I, what I mean when I say I think people get confused about what this means if we confess our sins. I think what he means is if we admit that we have sins. Look at the verse before it. Here's why I say that. Look at verse 8. Most people don't read verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He's writing to Christians. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Just let that sink in for a minute. If we pretend to be so holy and so pure and so perfect, holier than thou, that's like Pharisees. If we pretend that we're so perfect and so holy that we never do anything wrong, he says we deceive ourselves. Again, a lot of self-deceived Christians running around. Now, the next verse says, now in light of that, verse 9 says, but if we confess our sins, you know what he means? 
he doesn't mean specifically enumerating something you've done wrong. He means if we admit that, yes, I, I have committed sins. Yes, I am guilty on my own. He says, but we need to know this. He's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look at the next verse, verse 10. Here's how you know what, what the meaning of it is. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word's not in us. Why is that? If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Because he sent Jesus to the cross. Paul said the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins. If we say we have no sins, we're saying he died for no purpose. <laughs> Keep in mind all these other things that I said. He's our advocate. Uh, his propitiation, his sacrifice is what satisfies us. Now here's, go, here's what it means. Go back to verse 9 one more time. Again, you find out a lot of things by looking words up in the dictionary, by looking words up in the concordance. The concordance will tell you what the Greek words are. If you look up this word confess, you'll find out it is a form of a bigger word called confession. The word confession, if you look it up in the Greek language, is a compound word, and the two words are homo logia. Logia means something that is said or a message, uh, something of that kind. Homo means the same as. Homo logia means to say the same thing. To say the same thing as. That's what it means to confess. To confess means to agree with or to say the same thing. Same thing as what? The same thing he says. You notice that the two verses on either side of this, the bookends on this said, uh, if we say that we have no, not sinned, we make him a liar. In other words, he says we have. That's why he sent Jesus to die for our sins. So to say the same thing as him is to say the same thing as he says I've sinned, I agree with him. Yes, I've sinned, I need a savior, in other words. And I put my trust in that propitiation, that death on the cross. That's why Paul said, here's the message of the gospel. Jesus has already died for our sins according to the scriptures. What does that mean for me as a Christian? That means that he has already put into effect everything necessary to keep me, to make me right with God and to keep me right with God. You know, this is here in 1 John as well, if you back up just for a second. I didn't mean to spend so much time in 1 John, but just so you see that it's here. Uh, back up again, Anton. I'm reading it kind of in reverse order. Um, verse 7. Look at what it says. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Listen to this. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That word cleanseth is in a tense that means a continuous action. Another translation uh, says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, keeps us continually cleansed from sin. That's the way he wants you to look at it. The blood of Jesus is not just some formality that took place 2,000 years ago. He says it's something that is actively in, in, in your relationship with God keeping you clean. It's actively keeping you cleansed. Now, the reason that's good is what if you did something wrong and didn't realize it? Or what if you did something you thought was right and turned out to be wrong? <laughs> the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continually cleanses you from all sin. Well, what if you did do something wrong? Well, like, I, I, you know, it's amazing all the kinds of uh, ways that we try to rationalize things. Christians, you know, I talk to a lot of people who, uh, I've talked, I remember this one man, it's just amazing kind of mental gymnastics people go through to try to rationalize themselves. Well, this man finally admitted, yes, okay, since I became, he was trying to argue that, well, I never committed a sin after I was a Christian, because you can't sin again after you become a Christian. And finally, I, I convinced him that he had. Well, okay, I might have, but I didn't, do it deliberately. <laughs> I was tricked into it. <laughs> well, what if you have deliberately? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin. Whether you did it accidentally, whether you did it deliberately, whether you did it once, whether you did it a hundred times, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, is the only sacrifice for sin, and it's already been done. That's why Paul says, here's the gospel, if you want to know what the gospel is. I want to remind you, Corinthians, of the gospel. Keep it in mind. Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Why would he write to those Christians and say, you need to keep this in mind? Because even though we're Christians, there is a process going on in our physical lives. You see, if we were like the thief on the cross and we're going to die within the next 10 minutes, that'd be one thing. But we're not. We go on living. And he, by saying that he that began a good work in you will bring it to completion, he's admitting that progress needs to be made. He takes on the task. He does the progress. But he wants you to know that all the way along the way, as he's working in your lives, you stay in right standing with God. You are close to God by the blood of Jesus. You're near to God. And nothing can interrupt that. Nothing can disturb that because it's the blood of Jesus that established it and not you. That's all I got to say today. Let's all stand up. Yeah.